Good morning, everybody. Appreciate everyone being here this morning. We'll be in Acts chapter 17 momentarily. We are going through the sermons in Acts in this class and appreciate everyone being here this morning. Here's our objectives for the class. Really kind of been our North Star the whole quarter. Uh, the class schedule today will finish up this idea of preaching in a pagan world. Uh, Acts chapter 17 certainly deals with that. First question that I think we need to consider this morning is, what is an idol? What is idolatry? Because that's what we'll be dealing with in Acts chapter 17. To our modern world, the world idolatry conjures up pictures of primitive first century people bowing down to some small statue in their home or going to a temple and burning some incense to a particular deity, probably a Greco-Roman type deity, that this is some type of ancient pastime, that idolatry has no relevance or prevalence in our society today or in our culture today. What we must consider is that our society is not fundamentally different from these ancient ones. Each culture is dominated by a particular set or their own set of idols. So we live in a society that is inherently no different than Paul's. A world, a city full of idols... So the question may ask, we may ask ourselves, what is an idol? Especially in our culture today. Money. Money, yeah, absolutely. What else? Status. Yeah, yeah. What we how maybe the the social status, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. What else? Something you worship. Yeah. It's, an idol is inherently something you worship. I like how uh, Timothy Keller mentions that an idol is, let me pull this up, is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. Anything that is so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. If anything becomes more fundamental than God to your happiness, meaning in life, and identity, then it is an idol. He goes on to say, an idol has such a controlling position in your heart that you can spend most of your passion and energy, your emotion and financial resources on it without a second thought. Idols control us since we feel we must have them or life is meaningless. As we were just describing, an idol can be essentially anything. And they're not necessarily bad things. They're good things. Uh, an idol can be your family. An idol can be your children. An idol can be your career. It can be making money. We have to make money, right? That's a good thing. But when it becomes an ultimate thing, that that's all we crave, then it becomes a modern day idol. Achievement, your place in society. It can be a, a romantic relationship, security, comfortable circumstances. Uh, for John Whitaker, your beauty. Uh, your brains. Your competence. Uh, sexual pleasure, approval of your peers. An idol is whatever your heart claims that if I have that thing, then my life has meaning. That's when good things become ultimate things. You see where I'm getting at? Our society is riddled with idols. We have an idolatry problem. 
And it's not as far as you think as the first century streets of Athens that we're about to read about. So this sermon that Paul preaches is very applicable to us today. And I hope we can see how Paul ministers to a world or a city full of idols. Let's go ahead and read in uh, chapter 17. Paul speaks to the Athenians, and what we've gone through each of these classes is going through the speaker, the audience, the occasion, the message, and then the response of that message. So in chapter 17, in verse 16, it says, Paul was waiting for them in Athens. The question that you may be wondering is, why is he in Athens? And who is he waiting for? Why is he in Athens? What circumstances led him to go to Athens, according to the context? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, there was a, a, a bad situation that was, that was brewing. Uh, the Thessalonians, when he was in Berea, you see in chapter 17 and verse 13, it says, But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul and at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Verse 14, Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So he's waiting for Silas and Timothy to join him from this very dangerous situation in Berea. It's kind of, you see this cycle that we've described throughout Paul's ministry. Uh, He preaches the gospel at a synagogue, and people are chasing him from the prior cities that he has preached in. So let's keep reading in uh, Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. Luke tells us what Paul saw, what he felt, what he did, and what he said. Verse 16. Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others says, he seemed to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, What these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So like I just mentioned, Luke tells us what Paul saw, what he felt, what he did, and what he said. What did Paul see? What did he see in verse uh, 16? Yeah, he saw a city full of idols, innumerable temples, likely, shrines, uh, statues, altars, incense. The Parthenon kind of stood in Athens. Anybody been to, to Athens? Raise your hand, you've been to Athens. Cool. Yeah, I wish I could go. Um, the, the Parthenon stood, you know, as this home of the gods. Uh, Athena, Apollo, Jupiter, Venus, Mercury, Bacchus, Neptune, Diana, all these idols would have just been saturated in the community there. The whole Greek pantheon, the gods of Olympus are surrounding him. This is a city submerged in idolatry. What did Paul feel when he was walking the streets of Athens? What does it say? It says his spirit was provoked within him. You see in the NIV it describes it, which I think is probably a better way to to describe this. He was greatly distressed. Greatly distressed by seeing everything around him. All alone. Remember, he's, he's all alone. He's waiting on Silas and Timothy. He's likely describing this scene from his own personal account to Luke as he's developing his narrative. And he says that he was greatly 
distress. Yeah, Brian. Because he's around pagans, everything. Yeah, very good. Um, for us to be effective in our marketplaces, our, our cities, where we live, our, our surroundings, our worlds, we have to feel what Paul felt. We have to feel greatly distressed. This Greek word for the phrase greatly distressed is, is paroxysmo or paroxino. Uh, a word that we get our English word paroxysm, which is almost the idea of a seizure. Uh, this word tends to be associated, especially in the Old Testament, with God's extreme anger at the idolatry of Israel. Uh, when Paul felt uh, this abhorrence of the idolatry, he was aroused with the deep jealousy for the name of God. You see that idea throughout the Old Testament that God's jealousy was stirred up against the Israelites because of their idolatry. And what did this inward pain and horror cause Paul to do? Did he stay in his hotel? Did he curl up in a ball? Did he cry himself to sleep at night? Did he, did he just throw up his hands saying, you know what, these people are far too gone. These people are so wicked and so sinful. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can say. Absolutely not. He gets up and where does he go? He goes to the synagogue first, which is his typical tradition. He, he goes to the synagogue, but he just does not stop there. He doesn't go where people are worshiping uh, the, the God of the Bible. He goes... In the marketplace. Every day. That's where he went. He went with his faith to the marketplace. Now, what do we mean by marketplace? Is that just going to Kroger? Going to Aldi? Getting your groceries? In Kentucky, they say you're going to the grocery, right? That's, that's a Kentucky way to say going to the grocery store. Is he just going to the grocery store? No, this, this is, this is the, the agora, is what that word marketplace means. The agora in Athens. Uh, what, what do we know about the marketplace in Athens at that moment in, in society and in the world? It's, it's the cultural capital of the world. Um, you see, it's the intellectual capital of the world. Um, commerce, p politics, philosophy, spirituality, you name it, it was there. One commentator puts it this way, on or just off the marketplace were temples, law courts, state offices, public archives, libraries, shops, concert halls, dance halls, gymnasiums, theaters, and galleries. Now who was there? Everybody. Everybody was there. You had town officials and judges deliberating. You had artisans creating. This is where the stock market was, where business and commerce and trade was performed. You had media in the marketplace. Couldn't just get on your phone and get on Twitter and get on Google and find out the, the news of the day. You would stand in front of a herald face to face and he would provide you that news of the day. You had philosophers debating. Everything happened in the marketplace. We have nothing like this in our world today. This was not just a place to shop for food. This was a place to shop for everything. And so Paul goes into this space daily. He does not privatize his faith. He makes it part of the public scene. What does the world say about this today? We, we kind of live in a world that says, keep, keep your faith to yourself, right? They, 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 don't want, they don't want you to approach them on your faith. And I think the reason why is because everyone's got their truth. 
you know, you've got your truth, I've got my truth. Just keep it to yourself. That very similar presentation is in Athens. Uh, everyone had their own god in Athens. If, if you were part of commerce, you had a, a god of commerce. If you were part of uh, farming, you had a, a god of farming. Everyone had their own god. He could have simply kept it to himself. But Paul preaches a revolutionary message, as he has done throughout his ministry, as Peter has done throughout his ministry. This first century teaching is founded in the story of Jesus. He simply tells them the euangelion, the good news of Jesus Christ. He's telling them as a herald for King Jesus about Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And this story conjures up interest, uh, interest, introducing us to the audience and occasion of how he is preaching this. Anybody have any comments or questions off this? Yeah. Yeah, truth never fears investigation. <coughs> Certainly true. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he, he kind of uses that uh, to, to his advantage. Who's interested in, this, in hearing this message from Paul? What does the text say? There's two different groups. Yeah, so let's uh, give your uh, dissertation on the Epicureans and the Stoics. Jamie, go ahead. No, I'm just kidding. Um, to, to oversimplify it, Epicureans, and, and I gave a little more detail in, in, the, in the notes in the back if you want to get those. To, to oversimplify it, Epicureans believed this idea of eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. Uh, make life as pleasurable as you can uh, because the material world is all there is. The polar opposite to that was the Stoic philosophy, where people uh, believe that the whole world is permeated by God, uh, that it is God's, and that this is more of like a pantheistic way of understanding, that there's no real concept of God above creation. So they're kind of two polar opposite philosophical ideas. And if you kind of boil everything down, today, likely those who don't believe in a biblical God fall into one of these two categories, just generally speaking. Uh, that's likely the case. And just like Brian mentioned in verse 21, it says exactly what this audience is thinking. It says... Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. What specifically caught their attention in Paul's message? Resurrection. They, he thought, they thought that he was uh, speaking of a foreign divinity. And, he, and they call him this babbler. The idea of this babbler was a very derogatory term in their uh, ancient times. And it was literally meant a, a seed picker. Kind of like a bird going around and milling around on the ground, picking up seeds. Very similarly, Paul was this seed picker of ideas. He would go to different circles in the agora and pick up all these different ideas and just kind of make it into his own, is what they're describing there. So they whisk Paul away from the marketplace, and now they're in the Areopagus. Uh, what does the King James Version call the Areopagus? Mars Hill, maybe? Is that, is that what it says? Maybe New King James? Does, does anybody have a translation that says Mars Hill? Okay, maybe I made that up. 
Um, so the idea of the Areopagus is literally the heel of Aries, or the Greek equivalent of Mars. Um, it appears that he's speaking to some type of, of court of officials. And so he begins his message. Let's read in verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. The King James says very superstitious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. I think what's important that you see here is that there's no subjective accusation that is thrown out by Paul. His introduction is an objective observation of their religiosity. He acknowledges their desire to be religious. Look at the language of how he describes his walk through Athens. He says, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. How was this perception formed from Paul? How did he make that conclusion? That they're very religious in every way. That's a pretty bold statement to claim. Yeah, he, he, he saw all these idols. He says, for I passed along and observed observation the objects of your worship and he runs across to the unknown God in non-accusatory language rooted up in objective findings this anonymous altar becomes a point of contact for Paul this is the launching point to make known the God of the universe and throughout his speech you can see this noticeable balance between Paul making contact with the audience, but also trying to condemn their idolatry. On the one hand, Paul says that the Athenians, in a way, worshipped this unknown God. But on the other hand, they do not really know this God and need to respond and receive instruction on who this God is and what this God has done. So it kind of seems that Paul is suggesting that these Athenians have an inkling that such a God exists. But it's shown by their actions that they do not really know or properly acknowledge this God. He's simply proclaiming a deity that Athens had, in a sense, unknowingly had already been honoring and recognizing. And his message is centered around this God. Kind of making their understanding more clear. And Paul must proclaim the truth about this God and God's nature and his activities to his audience. And Paul proclaims and reveals this unknown God in five different ways in the next couple verses. Let's read verse 24. He describes God as the creator of the universe. Verse 24 says, The God who made the world and everything in it being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. So this argument sets the tone for all that follows. That there is this one particular God who made the world and all of its contents, and this same God is the one who is Lord of both heaven and earth. Because this God made everything and rules over it all, it should be obvious that such a God could not be confined to shrines made by human hands, all these idols that he's around. It's also important to consider that the word for life to his audience would be associated or, or closely linked to Zeus, their ultimate god. He was considered their source of life. And it's possible that Paul is alluding to not Zeus, but Yahweh is the source of life. And since he is the creator and Lord of all, let's look in verse 25. God is the sustainer of life. Verse 25, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. God continues to sustain the life which was created and given to his human creatures. Therefore, it's absolutely absurd to think that he who supplies our need 
should himself need our supply. We depend on God. He does not depend on us. And don't forget his target audience, the, the Epicureans and the Stoics. He's really touching on some things that they certainly would agree with him with. Uh, here he echoes the Epicurean idea that God needs nothing from human beings. But also he, he describes this Stoic notion that God is the source of all life. And because he is the source of all life, then God is the ruler of all nations. Look in verse 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Athenians would have believed that they originated from the soil of their native land, Attica. Thus superior to other peoples. But as creator of all things, Yahweh God created man from one origin, all created by God, out of his image, and all descended from a common ancestor. So this removed any belief from the Greeks that they were superior innately to the other people surrounding them. So Paul is thus contending that the true God, the one true God who created all humankind from one person is now reuniting all throughout the earth in one people for God. And God, having created the human race, has both the history and geography of each nation under his control, according to verse 26. What does it say? What, what is the purpose in arranging the time and place for all mankind, according to verse 27? Yeah, yeah. So, so that they, could, they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. I think this is the main point that Paul is preaching in his sermon. That this image is very clear of a blind man feeling and fumbling his way around, trying to find somebody or something. By the way, who experienced that very same thing in his life? Paul. What an amazing testimony. They, 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 they probably don't know that about him. But he, he had the exact same experience, fumbling around. Um, he can relate to this idea of God being so close to him, but he can't recognize it. He doesn't understand it because he is blind. I think that's a really powerful image that he gives. The overall effect of this verse is to highlight the dilemma and the irony of mankind. Though God is omnipresent, He's not so far away from any person, ironically, human beings are stumbling around the world in the dark trying to find God. We've all experienced this. When one is blind, even an object right in front of them, in front of their face, can be missed. So the problem that blinds us, groping around, fumbling around, unable to find him, is because of sin. Sin separates or alienates us or blinds us from God. And what Paul is trying to convey to his audience is that he is not distant. He's not unknowable. He's not uninterested in who you are and what you're doing because he is not far from any one of us. It is we who are far from him. And if it were not for our sins which separate us from him, he would be readily accessible to us. We are radically dependent on this source of life. And he quotes a, a 6th century B.C. poet, uh, Epimenides, for in him we live and move and have our being. They, that certainly would have resonated with the audience in applying that to this unknown God. Anybody have any comments or questions? Yes, ma'am.
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the faithfulness of God. Uh, he, he's not moving. We are the ones that are certainly moving. Yeah, absolutely. Any other comments? Yeah. Yeah, great, great point. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great point. Yeah, absolutely. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm sure being there and going there gives this a totally different flavor than somebody like me who's never been there. It's really cool. All right. Um, he quotes another poet, Aratus, to make the point that God is the father of human beings. Look in verse 28. It says, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring... We ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Why does Paul use two of their known poets? That's, that's pretty unique for the Bible, right? He's done it, he, he does it again actually in, in um, Titus maybe, could be wrong on that. Um, he does it in 1 Corinthians 15 at the end of that very famous passage. Why does he quote somebody who's not particularly, you know, Christian religion? Yeah. 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 They've they've. They've gotten really close to what this Yahweh God is. They've gotten super close to it, yeah. Um, Witherington mentions, from a rhetorical point of view, the function of the quotation or quotations here is to cite an authority recognized by one's audience to support one's point. It would have done Paul no good to simply quote the scriptures, a book the audience did not know and one that had no authority in the minds of these hearers. Arguments are only persuasive if they work within the plausibility structure existing in the minds of the hearers. Once again, he goes to where they are at. Just like he did in Acts chapter 14 last week. He goes to their understanding and reapplies it just like Travis said. They weren't too far off. But he's giving a name and he's giving a picture to it. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's impressive. Like as a as a somebody who argues something, he uses their logic against them to present his logic. That's really powerful. Um, where am I? At? Oh yeah. Um, while Aratus was referring to Zeus originally being the source of life, being the offspring, Paul gives us the honor. Of being God's offspring. He says, um, 
that the, the underlying assumptions behind idolatry is that a deity is like a thing. He says, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Paul says that the opposite is the case. We are God's offspring. God created us, not the other way around. The original quote that that he looks to is transformed, just like Travis said, to support Paul's message that human beings are created by God in God's image. God is not created in ours. Stott says, all idolatry tries to minimize the gulf between the creator and and his creatures, in order to bring him under our control. More than that, it actually reverses the respective positions of God and us. So that instead of our humbly acknowledging that God has created and rules us, we presume to imagine that we can create and rule God. So with that being said, Paul concludes his message by stating that God is the judge of the world. Look in verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Paul returns to the conclusion, at the conclusion of his message to what he originally began. Human ignorance. God in mercy previously overlooked this time of ignorance. But the times when pagans were groping in the dark for God and making idols to represent Him, this time is now ended. It's ended because of the result of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And this ignorance will no longer be endured because, what does He say in John 14 and verse 9? If you have seen the Son, you have seen the Father. God commands that everyone must repent because of the certainty of the coming judgment. It will be a universal judgment. God will judge the world. And He will judge with justice and righteous judgment. And it will be definite. The judge has been appointed. His Son, Jesus Christ, who sits on the the throne as Lord of heaven and earth. And why is He still reigning on the throne? What fundamentally has to be part of somebody who is reigning? They have to be alive. So that's the the ending of his argument is that he follows a risen Savior. God has proven this publicly to everybody by raising him from the dead. Turn to John uh, chapter 1. John, in his preamble to his gospel, describes a very similar presentation of when pagans were groping in the dark. In verse 9 of John chapter 1, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. I think you see lots of echoes from what we've described this morning in that statement that he is mentioning in John chapter 1. This idea of people being in the dark and ultimately becoming children of God. So what was the response from the audience? I think you see three different responses. Uh, Let's look in verse uh, uh, 32 of chapter 17. Go ahead and turn back to, to Acts. Verse 32, it says, Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. So there's the first response. Some mocked. What, what do you think that looks like? 
when somebody says somebody mocked you. Laughing, ridiculing. It's almost like the whole place just burst out in laughter when they described resurrection. Because these people would absolutely not have believed in the idea of resurrection. But what's a, what's a second response, somewhat of a neutral response? Yeah, they, they said, you know, we'll, we'll hear you again about this. So you see a negative response, a neutral response, and then what do you see as the third response? Very, go ahead. Yeah, I, I like how he describes that. He says uh, they believed and joined Paul. Why is it important that, that they joined Paul? Is there any significance to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's waiting on on uh, Timothy and Silas. Yeah, he's by himself, and and these are people who seem to be pretty important. Uh, Dionysus, the the Areopagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. So the question that all of us may be considering at this moment was Paul successful? How do you gauge? evangelistic success is it by numbers is it by how do you how do you gauge it was it was he successful i mean people there there are there are commentaries that debate this at the end of every commentary was he successful and they'll spend pages upon pages describing if he was successful yeah matt Yeah, yeah, he, he is exemplifying exactly what we should be doing. Planting and watering. That's what we're called to do. That's exactly what we're called to do. That's, that's the idea of us scattering the seed and seeing where it lands. And you see that. You see that in the text. Some mocked, it wasn't ready for the seed. Some others said, you know, we, we may listen to you again. Kind of see it rooting up maybe a little bit there. But then you see this seed becoming a mature plant by God giving the increase. Because these people believed and they joined Paul in this same crusade, for lack of a better term, of preaching the gospel. This euangelion. They're joining with King Jesus. There's some major ramifications to that. They, they are pagans. There are major ramifications to that. Yes, sir. I would just say that it begins by saying that they're following the Lord. And now they're following the Lord. And now they're following the Lord. Yeah. 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 All right. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. He could have easily just said, you know what, they're lost people. Or he could have said, oh, these, all these people are going to hell. He could have said something like that, right? And it would have probably been true. But where he goes with his argument is exactly what touches at least others. It says that at least three people. It touched their heart. They believed in this idea of a resurrected king. Um, I have not said a prayer <laughs> this whole quarter. Um, I think this is a very reasonable time for us to go to God in prayer to strengthen us. Our dear God and, and Father, we're so grateful that you have preserved your word for us. That we can find strength in it. That we can find the abilities to proclaim your word and to proclaim the truths of your son. God, as we go through our communities and in our marketplaces and as we uh, see the idols in our world, help us to destroy them from our own lives and to seek and destroy those that are in others as well, that we can 
Glorify your name in everything that we do. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.